Well, take your Bibles. Turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter number 14. While you turn there, let me uh, remind you that we're going to be uh, having some Sunday night gatherings beginning next Sunday. We often do this throughout the course of the summer as some of the small groups are taking a break. And uh, we're going to have a good time of fellowship, food, ministry to one another. Uh, if you uh, uh, recognize that you're in need to connect more with the body, I promise you this will be a great opportunity. Also be hopefully a good profitable time. We're going to be talking about how the gospel transforms community and how the gospel actually is the, is the foundation for our community. Uh, be a good time. We'll be meeting over in the other building. That starts next Sunday night at 6 o'clock. But uh, I want you to know that I'm really sold on the value of the community of faith. I love the church. I love the local church. And it's good to be a part of a local church. In fact, I would say that it's absolutely necessary. Uh, it's good that we're here this morning. It's good that you're here. It's profitable for your soul that you have showed up at church on a Sunday morning. Uh, the power that exists from the gathering together of the saints of God comes from a number of places. It comes from us being known and knowing others. And it comes from us committing to be givers and receivers. Uh, it's important that all of those things be true. You need to know and be known. You need to uh, come, you know, it's hard to do that in times like this when we primarily sit here and either stare at the back of somebody's head or stare at who's ever up front, but it's important to come to places where you can know others and be known uh, because it, 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 it's, it's necessary to be connected, to, be, um, to, to, to get to know the stuff that's going on in other people's lives and to let them get to know the stuff that's going on in your life. And if, if you don't get connected with other people, let me assure you of something. The day is going to come when the deficit of that is going to be heartily revealed in your life. This week, I uh, saw a picture of it as we watched uh, and, and grieved along with the West family as Tim, uh, Tim's mother died last Monday and we had a funeral for her and to see how the community of faith came together around a family and supported them and cared for them, prayed for them, and were there, were present. It was, it was evident that it was a blessing, so much so that even during the, the, the time of, of her memorial service, there was a great deal of laughter, there was a great deal of sharing thereafter, and and it, it, it made me realize all the more how important it is to know others and be known because the day's going to come when you're going to have need. I have people all the time come and knock on the door of the office wanting something because they're in a desperate situation. And I always try and seize those moments to share the gospel if I, if I have an opening, but more than anything, to ask them. And I ask this question almost every time. Are you a part of a local church? Now, I ask that question, hear me, knowing what the answer is. Because if they're knocking on our door as strangers, it tells me that they're not already connected with a local body. But they look at me most of the time, and they'll be honest, and they say, no, we're not, we're not connected with a church. We're not going to church right now. And I will look at them in all honesty, not trying to uh, propagandize their situation, but in all honesty, I'll say to them, listen, it's times like this that should prove to you the need of being connected with other people all the time. Because there will be times of deficit in your life. And if you're not connected with a community of faith, then when that time of deficit comes, you'll feel it. You'll know it. You'll need the support of other people, and when it's not there, you'll feel the weight all the more on yourself. So it's important to know and to be known. Listen, it's also important to be within a group like this and be both committed to giving and receiving. It's so important that we be givers. It really is. 
not just in the offering time, but just givers of our life. It's a calling I believe God has placed on all of us that we are to live being conduits through which he can bless the world. And if you are committed to being a giver, I believe that there are benefits that you're going to experience in this life that other people will not. Uh, I, I, am, I am more convicted as I grow older and as I learn and see more that the people who really have the power of God poured out on them in great measure are the people who have an intention on their life to be a conduit through which the power of God flows out onto other people. But if if you have not matured in your faith to the point that you've stopped being a dead sea, you know what makes the dead sea a dead sea? Is that it is receiving from all kinds of different places, but it has no place where it dumps out. And as a consequence, it's become concentrated with minerals and all kinds of things. Nothing can live in it except microorganisms that nobody probably wants. But we are not called to be dead seas. There are times when we need to receive, but we're also called to be givers. We're called to, to look for people around our life to make investment into. That, that, we can, that we can... Have you heard it's more blessed to give than to receive? I like both. But I'll tell you that I love being used by God to bless somebody else because when I'm a conduit for the power of God, I get a blessing along with whatever somebody else might receive in the process. If you're here and you know I, I, I receive, I receive, I receive, and I ask you, well, what do you give to others? You don't know how to answer that question? You're missing out on what the body could be for you. But can I tell you there's a flip side to that as well? Because I've also discovered that the people who most often give, 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 give are too proud to receive sometimes. No, I want to be a giver. I want to be a giver. I want to, I'll give to you. I'll be, I'll, it's like, but when you come to a place of need, it's just like, no, I don't really need, no, I don't really want that. In fact, when you have needs, you try your best to keep them a secret. As if you have a persona. To keep up. We know you're made out of mud. It's important to, 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 to allow others to minister to you in times of need. Listen, God set this thing up so that we would need each other within the body. We all have different roles. We have different uh, avenues through which God uses us. That's why he calls us the body. Everybody's not an eye. Everybody's not an arm. Everybody's not a foot. We're all together, and when we're functioning the way we should, knowing and being known, giving and receiving, we're very healthy, and we can do a lot to expand the kingdom of God as we encourage one another. If you can't see it already in your life right now, let me, let me not prophetically, this is, it doesn't take the gift of the prophet to see this. Let me, let me tell you something that God is doing in your life as we speak. He is inspiring you in ways you might not even recognize to commit yourself to a group of believers so that you might grow in grace and knowledge. Your relationship with the Lord is personal. I thank God that it is. I thank God that that, that he came to me personally through Jesus Christ. It's personal. But nowhere in the scripture is it said that it should be private. Well, that's good preaching. I haven't even got to my introduction yet. We're called into this thing together. And if you're not in this thing together, you're missing out on so much that God would have for you. I love being a part of the body of Christ. One of the ways that I find that that really being a part of the body manifests itself is in prayer. That, That when I know what's going on in your life because you're knowing and being known, 
It gives me the ability to pray for you. And did you know that, that, that most of the time you see the power of God manifesting in the Bible? And I'm talking about the unmitigated, miraculous power of God showing up and doing something that is beyond the natural order. When it shows up and somebody is healed, when it shows up and thunder and lightning and smoke cover the mountain, when it shows up and there's great power, most of the time that happens not because someone is praying for themselves, but because someone is praying for somebody else. And when we're knowing and being known, it gives us the opportunity to intercede for one another. And, and I, I consider it an honor and a privilege to pray for the needs that I'm aware of within this body. And I do pray for you. And I ask God to give me specific words for you. I really don't just jump in and start praying things. I try and seek the Lord and say, you know what? What's your will? What's your way? What's your plan in this circumstance? What are you trying to do in this person's life? How do you want me to pray? And if I get a word from the Lord about that, generally I'll share those things with you. But it's also incredibly comforting to know that other people are praying for you. I love praying for others, but I want you to know I love knowing that people are praying for me. I love knowing that I'm connected with folks and there are people who tell me all the time that they pray for me daily. That warms my soul like a blanket on a cold morning. It warms me because I know that God honors that. I know that God works through that. I know that God releases his power from heaven to accomplish his will through the prayers of the saints. And I'm comforted knowing that people pray for me. Let me tell you what really comforts me, though, is the knowledge that Jesus Christ himself is praying for me right now in heaven. Did you know that? Hebrews says that, that he lives to make intercession for us. What we're going to read here in, in John chapter number 17 is the whole chapter of 17 is a prayer. It's Jesus praying. You've heard it said that Matthew 6 is the Lord's prayer. It might be a misnomer. It's a model prayer. That's not a prayer that Jesus would pray because Jesus never had to pray, forgive me my debts. That's a prayer that he told us to pray. You want to listen to his heart revealing itself in prayer, it actually comes better from John 17. This is his high priestly prayer where he's interceding, not for himself, even though he's about to go to the cross. He's interceding for us. I know this was directed at the disciples in that day at that moment, but I pray that you can hear this with, with, with ears of faith and the Spirit as I read it this morning, that just as he would pray this for the disciples, then he is in heaven at the right hand of the Father, praying this for you and me now. And that's encouraging. So listen to Jesus as he prays over you. In John chapter number 17, beginning in verse 6. Rather long passage this morning. I've manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I've given them the words that you gave me, and they received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they believe that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, for those whom you've not, who, whom, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I'm coming to you. The only place in the Scripture where I believe it's recorded, God being called Holy Father. Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, 
that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the Scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they're not of this world, just as I'm not of this world. I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And you sent me into the world so that I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you pray this for us, that you have done it here. I believe you are doing it now. And that, that you stand in the gap as our high priest and you reconciled us to God. May you cause your word this morning to not return void as you promised. Bless it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. There's really a whole lot that I could teach from these verses. But what I want to do is emphasize really two things that I feel like are reoccurring themes throughout the verses that I just read. That's first the keeping power of our God and the part that his word plays in that. The keeping power of our God and the part that his word plays in that. First, let's notice the keeping power of God. I want you to listen to these references as I briefly say them one more time. Jesus calls us in verse 6, the people whom you gave me out of the world. He says again in verse 6, yours they were and you gave them to me. In verse 9 he prayed, he said, I am praying for them for they are yours. And the heart of Jesus' prayer is seen in verse 10, Holy Father, keep them in your name. Jesus rehearses that in verse 12. He says, while I was with them, I kept them in your name. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost. And although Jesus wants uh, us to stay in this world so that we can have impact here, in verse 15 he prays this, that you keep them from the evil one. As you read this prayer and read it along with me, I hope one thing did become obvious, or at least it will. And it's this, that I believe that it was the Father's power that Jesus looked to to be the thing that keeps us. The thing that keeps us in him is his power and not our own. Let me give you some good news today. You are being kept by the power of an omnipotent God. And it's good news. Jesus' prayer reveals for us that the same God who chose us out of the world, and it says over and over again that he chose us, that he gave us to Christ as an inheritance to him, that he claims us as his own, that he keeps us in his name, that he guards us so that the evil one can't steal us away from him. I told you in the past the real meaning of the word predestination. It, it means a lot of things to a lot of different people, but in the original context, what it literally means is that God placed a fence around you. That's the literal meaning of the word, that God places a fence around you. It's as if the Father looked at you and said, this one is mine. He put a fence around you and said, I claim this one. Let me ask a question. When God lays claim to something, who can dispute that? Do you think you can? Because because honestly, all of our arms, I have to buy shirts that are somewhat bigger than I need to get them to fit me in the arms. I have long arms for my body. 
I can scratch my knee without hardly bending over. My arms are too short to box with God, as all of us are. And it's important for us to recognize that when God lays claim on us, it's not something that even we can resist. The enemy can't resist it. We give the enemy a whole lot of credit sometimes. We need to at some level because without the power of God working through us, he'll whoop us. But, but to an omnipotent creator looking at his creation, he is infinitely more powerful than the enemy. Can fallen creation affect God's claim on us? Obviously not. He created, he controls. Can circumstances? We may be under the circumstances from time to time, but he is always above the circumstances. Can anything under heaven or in heaven dispute God's claim on his children? The answer is no. I'll refer to Paul in Romans 8. He said, beginning in verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Look at verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, I am sure, I am completely confident that neither death nor nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You need to drink deep, friends. God laid a claim to your life, and there's nothing that can change it. If you are in Christ, you are forever His, and you will be kept His, not because of any other power in the universe, but His. <sighs> it will. It gives me a good case of the happy. It was God who placed a boundary around us. He claimed us out of this world, and He keeps us by His power. I'm confident in this just like Paul was in Philippians. Chapter number 1, verse 6, he says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I am so thankful that my security is based not on my willpower, but rather on his. <laughs> I'm weak, wishy-washy when left to my own means. But he is the rock, the refuge that I run into and am saved. Listen to Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, 3, 4, and 5. Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and to an inheritance that is, listen, is imperishable, it's undefiled, and it's unfailing. Kept, that word keeps popping up, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Y'all, I grew up believing and being taught, really, that the human will was the most powerful thing in the universe. Now, nobody actually came out and said that. But that was the implication that was, that was at the heart of so much of the teaching that I heard. They, they encouraged me, you choose God when you want to choose God. You for that matter, can leave God when you want to leave God. You are the master of your own destiny. In the grand scheme, it made me pretty doggone important and gave me all the power. And although I have to admit I liked the idea of having all the power, I truly have come to believe that that doesn't line up with the Word of God. And I'm thankful 
Because when I have all the power, it makes me entirely insecure. Because I know me. And although I can see entirely how people come to the conclusion from the Scripture that their will is the most important thing, I've just come to disagree with that entirely. I've come to believe, to be fully convinced that I am living in the peace of God knowing that He is more powerful than I am. And I am saved today because He put a fence around me and said, this one is mine. Through the gospel, he opened my eyes that had been blinded by the works of the enemy. He overpowered my rebellious spirit with the power of his grace. He brought my dead spirit back to life that I had killed through willful sin. He gave me faith as a free gift so that I might be able to respond. He washed my sins away with the vicarious atonement of Christ on the cross. He filled me with His Holy Spirit as a sign and a seal of His work. And He has committed to complete all the good work that He began in me. And that means this, that I was saved because of Him. I am saved because of Him, and I will be saved because of Him. And one of the true evidences of His grace that's working in my life right now is that I don't see this as a license to go live however I want to, but rather it's created within me an overwhelming sense of gratitude that motivates me to live in a manner that's pleasing to Him. Not in order to get Him to love me, but because He already does, and He's done so well. I want to know Him better. I want to serve Him more passionately. I want to see His fame increased on this earth. I want to be a vehicle through which the kingdom of God comes. We should praise God today if we're in Christ. Hear me, y'all. We should praise God today if we are in Christ because it means that His keeping power has placed a fence around us, and it's His power that will make it so forever. But you should also note that Jesus saw the Word as a central part of that keeping power because the Word is one of the ways that God brings grace to us. I want you to listen once again to Jesus' praying. In verse 6, He said, They have kept your Word. Now, obviously, He doesn't mean they did that perfectly, but it was the pattern of their life to commit themselves to keeping the Word. The words that He gave were given, according to verse 13, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. You want to experience true happiness on this earth, you do so by knowing His Word and keeping it. He affirmed part of His ministry was in verse 14. He said, I've given them your word. And he prayed that that word would be transformational. In verse 17, he says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And he prayed that just as he was set apart by God's truth, that according to verse 19, that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Friends, Every time he mentions the word, truth, the word that he was given, the word that he gave, he's talking about the revelation that he had through the Scripture in the Old Testament and the revelation that he gave through his teaching, which we have recorded for us in the New Testament. And the Word of God is powerful. And Jesus prayed that the Father would keep them, and he saw the role, the Word, the truth played in that. He prayed for them that they might continue to see the fruit of the Word develop in their life. And right now, in heaven, I believe He is praying that the Word of God would bear fruit in the lives of each and every one of His children, us today. Because the Word is powerful. Listen to this from Hebrews, chapter number 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Powerful. Um, you got to stop looking at this like it's just some other book. you got to stop looking at it like it's an optional part of the Christian experience. You will never truly know God apart from the revelation of the truth in the Scripture. And if you're dependent upon anything else to try and understand Him, you will be led astray. It's the revelation of His Word. I'm preaching to you today not just so I can fill in the gaps where you refuse to study or refuse to read the Word, The preaching of the Word of God is supposed to be instruction by example for how you might grow in your own ability to understand the Word, to pick it up and read it, to understand it. Listen, I know I'm not the village idiot, but I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I'm not the brightest bulb on the tree. And if I can understand the Word... You can understand the Word because the only real benefit that any of us have is not our intellect, it's whether or not we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And if the Spirit of God is within us, then we can all understand it. And we need to acknowledge that this book has value beyond that which we can comprehend. And it is more powerful than we give it credit for. Okay, I'm not going to chase too many rabbits. I want you to know the Word of God always performs. Isaiah 55 verse 11 says this, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Every single time the Word of God is applied to your life, it is performing a task in you, whether you're able to see it or not. God's Word does not return to us void, ever. You say, well, I didn't feel anything. (laughs) I'm going to choose to believe the Word rather than my own feelings. I'm going to choose to believe the Word rather than your testimony about your feelings. That's a good practice by and large, by the way. That I will trust the Word above all else. And he said that it always performs a task. It's transformational. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. God uses his word to make us into the people that he created us to be. And we're all going to be shaped by something Some folks let culture shape them. Some folks let media shape them. Some folks let, you know, this person or that person shape them. Friends, let's let God shape us through Christ as we commit ourselves to the Word of God. I know the objections. I read the Bible and I just don't understand it. I feel like it's not making a difference when I read it. You know, this is at least 2,000 years old, some of it much older than that. It's just like it doesn't seem relevant anymore. I read the Bible and I get distracted. Let Let me address those individually. If you feel you can't understand the Bible when you read it, David, I believe, had the solution for that. 
And his solution was the Word of God itself is the solution for you not understanding the Word of God. Listen to Psalm 119, which is affectionately called by some the instruction manual for the Bible. It's a very long chapter, but it it heralds how important the Word is to us. Listen to verse 130. The unfolding of your words gives light. And it imparts understanding to the simple. That's me. (laughs) Say, I don't understand the word. Then keep reading it. I'm going to fill you in on something that goes on in my head. Okay? Now, once I say this to you, it's got to change the way you and I interact with one another. Okay? Okay? (laughs) let's make a deal. When someone looks at me and says, I just can't understand the Bible, what it tells me is they don't try and read it. Because Psalm 119 says very clearly that it gives understanding to the simple. And if you commit yourself and say, If I don't understand it today, I may understand it tomorrow. And if I don't understand it tomorrow, I'm going to understand it next week. And if it takes me a year or 10 years, I'm going to commit that the Word is going to have its function in my life. And I will be someone who can read the Bible and understand it for the glory of God. Because that's one of the things that it does for us. Our minds are darkened many times by so much different stuff. And one of the ways that our spiritual man gets tuned in to the voice of God that's speaking through the Word is simply to read it. It's simply to read it. So if you ever come to me and say, I just can't understand the Bible, now you know what's going to go through my head. I may or may not say to you, well, that's just evidenced by the fact you don't read it. But you'll know I'm judging you. (laughs) He promised through Isaiah that it wouldn't return void. If you happen to feel like it's not making a difference, you need to know that it is regardless of how you feel. Its relevance is eternal. And Isaiah, once again, Verse, chapter 40, verse 8, it says that the grass, grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of God will stand forever. We will not be reading the New York Times in heaven. Shakespeare will not be our book of choice. The eternal Word of God will be with us forever and ever and ever. I can assure you of something. If you feel like you get distracted every time you pick the book up to try and read it, know that your flesh and the enemy don't want you reading the Word or studying the Word. And they will both resist you. Sometimes it doesn't even take the devil. Listen, there's enough of my flesh going on that I'll start reading it and I'm just like, I'd really like to watch a little Netflix right now. Am I going to pick this up and read it? Let me tell you what my great temptation is. That I pick it up and read it thinking about what I'm going to say to you guys. Rather than just picking up and reading and asking God to transform me and speak to me through it. That's my temptation. Know this, that we all have flesh that we have to deal with. And know this, that the enemy will resist you with distraction and all kinds of things that take place when you try and set time aside to to devote to the Word. But I want you to know that right now in heaven, Jesus is interceding for you that you would commit yourself to the revealed Word of God. And I believe that the Spirit of God is at work in you right now to see that come to pass. It's an avenue through which God gives us grace. And committing to it is always to your benefit. 
Y'all, I'm very comforted by the assurance that Jesus is praying for me and for us. I am. He's praying that the Lord keep us. I've often, you know, uh, I'm used in times past about what Jesus and the Father's conversation was about me as they sit in heaven and look down. You know, Jesus looks over at the Father and said, look at him, he's about to do it again. Can you believe that? As if God would be bound up with unbelief. But can you believe that he did that? He's like, yeah, I knew he was going to do it. He said last time he wasn't ever going to do it again, but doggone it, there he is. He's doing it again. And it's like, "Mm -mm mm-mm-mm. See, that's why I had to go to the cross and pay such a high price because of that kind of boneheaded stuff right there. Almost like they're lamenting me. That's really not the conversation between the Father and the Son. The Son right now is in heaven interceding on your behalf. He's looking to the Father, and he's saying, Father, would you keep him? Would you, would you cause the Word to transform him? Would you cause the Word to sanctify him? Don't do it just because of him. He, he's not worthy enough in himself. But you, you look at me. Remember, I went to the cross. I took on all of his sin. I paid all of the price so that I could bring him back into relationship with you. And now when you look at him, you see me, and I know you love me. And I know you think I'm worthy. And I want you to treat him the exact same way. That inspires me. It does. It inspires me. It inspires, inspires me to want to know this God better. It inspires me to want to glorify this God more. We do that by knowing and doing the revealed Word of God. <laughs> Can I be corny for a minute? This book is a weapon of mass instruction. It is a weapon of mass production. A weapon of mass deduction. And it will radically transform the landscape of your life if you would only commit yourself to it. Years gone by, it was very common in the English-speaking world that no one had a copy of the Word of God in their possession. They were either too fearful of the Roman church to possess one or they were too poor to possess one. And hundreds and thousands gave their life in the English-speaking world for us to have the Word of God translated into our language. Today, there will be people who give their life in parts of our world now because they're caught with a copy of this book. So easy for us to take it for granted when so many have given so much for us to have it and so many are paying a dear price for having it right now. I want to encourage you. Since the Spirit of God is at work in us, in accord with what Jesus is praying for us in heaven right now. I wonder if you might submit to embrace the importance of it today. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, I am grateful that I am kept because of your power. But I'm also grateful that you gave me the word of God as an avenue for me to experience your grace. And so our confidence, confidence is based 100% on you and your power. God, would you inspire us that we might commit more fully to that which you placed in our hands? Thank you for the blessing of its prevalence. It's so common. It's so easy to come by. Help us to not neglect it. In Jesus' mighty name.
Amen. Amen.